So the topic tonight that we're going to talk about is invest in yourself, how to optimize your life experience and the Kavanellian. Okay, yeah. Okay, so I want to start off with a question. We're going to talk for a bit. I'm going to talk for a bit. And we'll come back to the question at the very end. So the question is can you afford to invest in yourself? And this is a personal question for each of us. Can we afford, can each of us afford to invest in ourselves? So I want to go through, we're going to break this up into three parts. The first part, we're going to talk about the meaning of investment, basic principles. And by basic principles of investment, I don't mean financial investment advice. Um, I'm the last person you want to take that from. I mean the idea, the concept of investing. What's the concept of investing? What does it mean? Then the second point that we're going to cover is we're going to talk about an example, an instance of Hashem making the quintessential investment, the ultimate example of making an investment on Hashem's part that we're obviously going to be taking lessons from and learning from. Then the third thing that we're going to talk about is the ultimate investment that every single one of us can make, the most valuable of all investments. And when I say most valuable of all investments, I don't just mean idealistically and Baruchnius, not to downplay the value of Baruchnius, obviously, but very practically speaking, in terms of our quality of life on a day-to-day -day basis, what's the number one best value investment that every single one of us can make? That's going to be the third part. And then we'll come back to the question. Question being, can you afford to invest in yourself? So what does the word invest mean? What does it mean to invest? Now, the first thing that probably comes to mind for most people is money, portfolio, putting money away. That's financial investing. That's investing in our financial future. But what the word investing means is to allocate resources. It may be money and maybe time. It may be effort, maybe something else. Investing means allocating resources to some sort of endeavor, some sort of undertaking. And the reason that we're taking resources that we have available and we're putting them into something, which means that while we put these resources into this, we put money into this portfolio, we put our time into this project, we put our effort into something, that money or that time or that effort is now not available to use for something else. The reason that we do that is because we expect, we anticipate, we hope that it's going to result in an outcome that is good, a desirable outcome that we would not have been able to have without making that investment. And the outcome, we hope, is good enough to justify allocating those resources, giving that time putting in that effort, putting away that money, whatever it is, right? That's what investing is about. So just to break that down a little, point number one is when we invest in something, there's something that we want. That's the starting point is really at the end. So if my summer shop is filled up, there's something that we want. Then there's something that needs to be done in order to get what we want. And then in order to do that, we have to give something. We have to spend time. We have to put in effort. We have to allocate money, whatever it is. So we're investing in order to make something happen with the hope and expectation that it will generate an outcome that we want. And that's good enough to justify what we put into it. Right? And that's the term ROI, return on investment, means that there's the return on your investment. The only reason you ever invest something is because you want to get something back, something that's worth more than what we put in. Otherwise, it's not a successful investment. That's the point of an investment, to get back more than we put in. The return on the investment, the thing we get back that's worth more, which justifies the fact that we put in whatever we put in. That's generally the concept of investing. Right? Talk about basic example. The most common thing that people think of when talking about investing is money. That's the the the... the instance in which the term investment is used far most frequently. So when a person, what, what, do, what do people mean when they talk about investing financially? It means that there's an outcome that they want to have, which is to be financially secure in the long term, retirement, whatever it is. It may be a short term, but there's something that we want, financial security to generate a huge amount of profit, something. In order to generate that, in order to, to, to generate that financial security, 
to, to generate that profit, there's something we need to do, which means we need to take money and put it into something that's going to cause that money to grow, something that's going to increase in value, something that's going to return a profit, something that's going to return interest, whatever it is, whatever the specific example is. So we take money that we have, and whilst we have the money in our pocket, while we have the money in our hand, it's available for us to do whatever we want with it. And then we take that money and we invest it in something, whether it's a business or portfolio or company, whatever it is, which means that now we don't have access to that money anymore. We have given up access to that money, which means we've given up the ability to use that money for whatever we want, which we could have done before. So that's the cost. What we're investing is the access to that money. And the idea is that we, we're investing that money into something that's going to make it grow in value so that we end up with money that has become worth more than it was to a degree that justifies letting go of it for that period of time. So that's investing financially. Another kind of investment, very similar related, but not exactly the same thing, would be investing in a business. Person has a business, building up a business, and as the business generates revenue, generates profit, a person can take the profit and do something else with it. Or the person could say, look, this business is successful. It has a huge amount of potential. Every bit of profit that comes in, I'm going to put it back into the business so it will be able to grow faster and faster. And then we'll be able to become more and more and more profitable. So the money that we could have taken out and spent on whatever we wanted or used for something or invested in a portfolio, we're now investing in the business. We're putting it there in the hope that it will cause the business to grow to a degree that it will increase in profit to a degree that justifies having given away access to that money. That's investing in a business. And then what I would say is, that, well, this is a very different category, but investing in health, investing in physical health. Now, investing in our health, the things that we're putting in generally, the biggest things are going to be time and effort. And taking care of our health is very high maintenance, which is why so many of us don't do it as much as we should. Eating good, healthy food, good quality food takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of money. Doing exercise regularly takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. So what we're investing is our time, our effort, our money. And there's a reason why so many people don't take care of their health as much as we should. And that's because it's a very big investment. You have to invest a huge amount of effort, a huge amount of time. But that being said, the ROI, the return on that investment, I would say out of everything we've talked about so far is without a question, disproportionately the greatest. If everybody would just focus on eating a diet, which and by diet, I don't mean cutting things out. A diet means the food that we eat. If everybody would just eat a diet that's 95% good quality food. Bite of junk here, a nibble over there, fine. But if 95% plus of everything we ate was good, nutritious, healthy food, things that we should be eating, and every one of us did a substantial amount of exercise on a daily basis, whatever it is, whatever the recommended amount is, the, first of all, very simple, longevity, life expectancy. Our life expectancy would have increased drastically on average. Our well-being internally, our mental well-being, our emotional well-being would increase drastically. Our alertness, our energy levels, our ability to focus, our ability to be productive, to make things happen, to get things done. Taking care of our health would actually be an investment in our, in our financial well-being also, and an investment in our business, in our work, whatever we do, because the bottom line is when our body is healthy, we can think more clearly, we have more energy, and we can do better and be more productive and effective at everything. So investing in our health, the investment is we put in the time, we put in the effort, we put in the money, and that the desirable outcome is living a longer life and living those years with a higher quality of life, feeling better, feeling more positive, feeling more happy, having more energy, being feeling more positive, et cetera, et cetera, all these things. And just to, you know, to follow that up with what the Ms. Richard Market said, that a small hole in the body is a large hole in the neshama, is results, whatever the exact terminology is, it effectively is a large hole in the neshama, which means that investing in our physical health is actually an investment in our health. It's an investment in our neshama because the healthier our body is, 
Look, living a Yiddish life is very demanding. It's a very, very demanding life. And if we have more energy, if we have more ability to focus good, we can learn Torah better. We have more energy to daven better. We can do more mitzvahs. We can do more mitzvahs. We can help more people. Everything that we have to do, everything that's part of the life of a Yid, we can do better if our, our physical health is better. So investing in our physical health is also an investment. It's going to result in all the benefits that come out of it. And it makes sense to get such a massive positive outcome. You have to make a big investment. It doesn't come easy. And on top of the, the, the return on that investment, the, the positive outcome we get in terms of the health in our body, it's also we have a second layer of that, which is the, the growth in Ruchnius layered on top of that. So I think at this point, it's you know relatively clear what the idea of investing is, what investment means. It means putting something in, allocating resources into some sort of endeavor or undertaking, in the hope and expectation that there will be a positive outcome that will result, that will justify putting away those resources, putting them into whatever we put them into. So now I want to talk about this example of Hashem making the quintessential investment. And then we're going to talk about what we can learn from that. So we're just coming now from Benam Sarum, from Tishabov. And in connection with the Chorban of the Beis Amikdash, the Gemara tells a story. It says that Raman Gamliel, Rabbi Elazar ben Azari, and Rabbi Yeshua were walking together with Rabbi Akiva. And there's a whole series of things of, da of what I do, dialogues, but conversations between them that the Gemara talks about. And one of them, it says, sure, they were walking, and they came to the Harabais, and they saw a fox coming out. And the three of them, Raman Gamliel, Rabbi Elazar ben Azari, and Rabbi Yeshua, burst out crying. They were bawling. They were distraught. Understandably, a fox comes out of the, of the Kosh Kadoshim. Rabbi Kippa burst out laughing. Right, so they asked him, what are you laughing for? And so she says to them, what are you crying for? So they respond to him that this place about which it says, a place in which no one other than the Kayan God can go in and penalty, not just penalty of death, automatic death resulting from the overwhelming Kedusha of this place. Sure, in Hulk play, and now foxes are running around, almost rodents running around there, and we shouldn't cry. Of course, we're going to cry. What's the question? And so he says to them, So why am I laughing? He says, Until so long as the Navua of Uriah about this happening had not been fulfilled, I was concerned that maybe the Nebuah of Sakhari would have been fulfilled. So basically, very quickly, what's going on here, there's a, a Nebuah of Uriya about this happening, about Shalom, about these you know, terrible things happening in the, um, after the Chorban. And then there's Nebuah of, of Zachariah about the Gula, about the coming of the subsequent Beis Amikdash. Now, really, those Nebuahs were after the first Beis Amikdash and foretelling the second Beis Amikdash. So now, after the second base of Mikdash is destroyed, it's like, well, who says that what, that what Zachariah said is, is going to happen again? He said it about the second base of Mikdash, and now that was destroyed. Maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe we've got nothing to look forward to. No more base of Mikdash. So then, and in the Lashon of the Nebuah, so it, it comes out that the Nebuah of Zachariah is dependent on the Nebuah of Bria. So Zachariah foretold the coming of a future base of Mikdash. His foretelling of that, his Nebuah, was dependent on the Nebuah of Bria that about what they saw. So Rabbi Akiva was worried, maybe we're not going to have another base of Mikdash. Then he sees that not only was Uriah's Nebuah fulfilled after the first base of Mikdash, but was fulfilled again by the second base of Mikdash. So now we know that the same way we got another base of Mikdash after the first one was destroyed, we'll get another one after the second one was destroyed as well. And first out laughing, super happy, very excited. Okay, so it's kind of understandable, maybe to a degree, but but laughing, I can understand if Rabbi Akiva would have been overcome with relief, would have been happy. Laughing, the bottom line is they're standing in front of a destroyed base of Midrash. And yes, he knows there's going to be another base of Midrash at some point. But maybe laughing's a little bit much. Relief, yes. But laughing, it would have been better had the second base of Midrash not been destroyed. That would have been a much better option. So why is this something to laugh about? And so. To answer that question, we have a medrash, Yafat Shemayim. And the medrash says that that's something that's quoted very frequently throughout the Siddhas. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but just to abbreviate the way that the Rebbe abbreviates it leaves out more because the medrash elaborates in sequence. It doesn't really say it and then elaborates. So just the, the, the parts that 
the actual, I'll, I'll, I'll say it in a way that flows, we'll, we'll elaborate very briefly. So, Omarav, the, the Yalf Shimoni says, Omarav Rav says, Allah Arya, the Mazal Arya, the the lion arose in the month of the lion and destroyed the lion. Almanas in order, that a lion will come, the Mazal Arya, in the muzzle of the lion, the Yibna Arya, and will build Arya. So, what is the Medrash? The Medrash elaborates. Allah Arya said in the book when Rab said, Arya, a lion arose. That's talking about the Bukhat Netzar, but Mazal Ari, when it says Mazal Ari, that means the Chodesh HaKamidish, the Chodesh of. The Hef with Ariya and destroyed Ariya. What's Ariya? This third, the, the lion here is a metaphor for three different things. The third thing that it's a metaphor for is, and it quotes the positive Ariya, Ariya, which is talking about the Nisbeah. So the Bukhat Netzar came in the month of Av and destroyed the Bes Amidash, destroyed the Nisbeah specifically. Al Manas in order. Shayavai Arya Zeha Kodesh Baruch Hashem is also a lion. And that Hashem is, is um, the lion is used as a metaphor for Hashem throughout the being. But Mazal Arya in Chodesh of again. The Yivnes Ariel and will rebuild the Mizbeah. The base of English. Now, the words I want to focus on here two words. It says, Nebuchan Netzar came in Av and destroyed the base of English. Now, when we say that he did that in order that Hashem should come and rebuild it, it's not saying that was Nebuchan Netzar's intent, obviously. It's saying that's why Hashem allowed it to happen. Because Hashem could have not allowed it to happen if he wanted to not allow it to happen. So why did Hashem allow it to happen? Al Manas in order, Shayavai Arya, that Hashem would then come, the Mazal Arya in Chodeshav, the Yiv Nasaril, and rebuild it. Al Manas in order. Those words here are very, very important. I want to focus on those words for a couple of minutes. Right? If someone comes and says, and, and we're going to focus on here, really what makes an investment an investment. We're going to have two people. If someone comes and says, listen, um, you know, I, I really need $1,000. I have something that's really important. I need $1,000. Can I borrow it? I'll give it back to you in a month. Yep, it's a mitzvah to give a loan to a year if you're able to. But the person who comes and asks for a loan is not going to say, can I borrow $1,000? I really need it in order that I should give it back to you in a month. Like, no, you can, I'm not giving you the money in order for you to give it back to me. I'm giving it to you on condition that you're giving it back to me. If someone comes and says, listen, I've got this incredibly profitable business. It, it's really, it's, it's, it's making a profit. It's, it's doing really well. It's ready to explode. Now, this example I'm going to give is obviously not going to be realistic at all, but hypothetically, just to illustrate the point. And right now, it's really ready to grow, and I'm having... Just a cash flow problem right now. It's not, it's a it's an immediate short-term problem. I need ten thousand dollars to put into the business. And within three months, that ten thousand dollars is going to turn into a hundred thousand dollars. Guaranteed, hundred percent guaranteed. I already have nine thousand dollars. I want you to give me back. I need one more thousand dollars. You give me a thousand dollars, your thousand dollars will become ten thousand dollars in at the end of the month or three months, whatever the time might be. So now the person, you're, what you're doing is you're giving the money, you're giving away access to the money. Why? In order that you should get back 10 times as much. I'm giving away $1,000. Why? What's my motivation? My motivation is in order to get back $10,000, in order to make a profit, in order to multiply my money. That's in order. I'm not lending someone money in order to get back what I lent them. In order means that there's some sort of motivation. There's something positive, it's going to be better. And in order to get that better thing, I'm going to give something away now. That's what investing is. Investing is in order. You invest money in order to make a profit, in order to get a positive outcome that depends on making the investment. You don't loan money in order to get it back. You loan it on condition to get it back. It's two very different things. So when the Medrash says that Hashem allowed the base of English to be destroyed, it doesn't say because of or on condition that it would be rebuilt. It says in order for it to be rebuilt, which means there's something about Hashem coming to build the base of Mikdash, the third base of Mikdash, which justifies and makes it worth Hashem's while to allow the previous base of Mikdash to be destroyed. And we're, we're going to focus also on the words here. It says Hashem allowed the base of Mikdash to be destroyed in order that Hashem will come and rebuild it. So what's the big, what's the profit here? What, what's the thing? That's so much better about the third base amigdash that it justified the second base amigdash being destroyed, which also includes 2,000 years of gold and everything that's happened in between. It's going to have to be a pretty big profit to justify all of that. Almanas, 
for Hashem to have done all of this in order to get that third base. I mean, just going to have to be pretty big. What, what could it be? What could be something that's going to justify that? So, I mean, it's summed up very briefly, super concise, it's not even summed up, it's just the, the, the headline of, of the idea is, in Apostle Kinchagin, it says, God the cover, the glory of this base amigdosh, this last base amigdosh, will be greater than the first. Now, in the shot of the Pasuk, it's primarily referring to the second base amigdosh, the second base amigdosh. And we have the Gemara and the Midrash, and everyone says the same thing. And we have Machlekes about when the second base amigdosh, number one, was bigger than the first base amigdosh, number two, it lasted longer than the first base amigdosh. So, God could mean in terms of length, it could mean in terms of size, it could mean both, it does mean both effectively. But there are Mepharshim, the Malbim, among others, who says that this is not only referring to the second base Amikdash, but it's directly and explicitly also talking about the third base Amikdash. And it's saying that the third base Amikdash will be greater than the first two. And I want to read now a couple of lines each from two different places in Zoya. And there, there are four or five speaks maybe places in Zoran to Kunizor where it, it says the same sort of thing, but the two halves of the statement are the most clear in two different places. So I took a half from each one and put them together. So I'm going to read and translate now. This is from Zoran. The house that was built by man, the, it's talking about the first spot in Mikdash were built by man, or begin because they were built by man. Man is limited, man is fallible. Man is mortal, therefore, begin kach, therefore, lo yiskayim, the first part of English, were not permanent. They were not eternal. It makes basic sense. You do the math. There's no way that a person or any mortal being could create something that could be eternal. We could create something that maybe could last centuries, maybe millennia, not eternal. Anything that's man-made by definition, it's made out of physical materials. It's made as a result of physical processes. It's going to deteriorate over time. It may be very slow, but it'll deteriorate over time. And so then the, the Zohar continues, so Shlomo have a Yoda, and Shlomo Melech knew when he built the base of Mikdash that he was building a base of Mikdash that was man-made and would not be eternal, would not last forever. It's going to have a lifespan. It's going to deteriorate and it's going to come to an end. And because and he knew that because it was man-made, it would not be eternal. But Amar, and this is what it says in the Pasuk in Tehillim, Im Hashem lo if Hashem, there's actually a beautiful, uh, very beautiful acapella song about this possible when crazy viral, has got millions of views. Im Hashem lo yiv nevayis shav am lupoi nofe. Im Hashem lo yiv nevayis, if Hashem doesn't build the base of Midosh, shav for nothing am lupoi nofe. The people who built it worked for nothing. Why? Because it's man-made. It's not made by Hashem, so it's not eternal. It's going to have an end. Shav for nothing is maybe overstating in a, you know, a bit strong language, but Ultimately, if it's built by man and has an end, it's not, it's not even in the same category of value as something that's made by Hashem. The people who build this space and toil for nothing because it's not going to be eternal, it's not made by Hashem. Now we're going to skip to another place in Soya that's basically continuing the idea. We get down there for when the base amigdash will be built by Hashem, the third base amigdash, Yehei Kayom Aladari Dorin, that's going to last forever. That's going to be eternal. And about that, about the base amigdash being eternal, why? Because it's it's made by Hashem. Hashem is eternal. Hashem is not eternal because Hashem is so strong that it can last forever. Hashem is the creator of time. Hashem is not subject to time. Which means that Hashem's creations are not subject to time. If Hashem makes something directly with his hands, it's not subject to time. It doesn't need to deteriorate. It's created by the creator of time. It's created by the creator of the laws of physics that mean that things will deteriorate over time. So it's not subject to any of that. And therefore, it will be eternal. It's built by Hashem. Hashem is eternal because time exists inside of Hashem rather than vice versa. And therefore, I like it more, about that it says, God will you cover the basis of our generation. The last base of Migdosh will, it's covered, it's glory will be greater than the first one. The Kadma, because the first one, the first two, Ismail and Devanash, were created by man, and therefore they ended up being destroyed. Baha'i and the third base of Migdosh, Ali, which will be built directly. 
So here, what we have is we have, we all know that the third base of English is going to be a term. That that you know is, is relatively common knowledge. But the question is why? What does it mean that it's eternal and why? And the answer is not Hashem will not allow it to be destroyed. Right? It would make sense. It could make sense to say that the third base of English will be eternal. Why? Because Hashem promised it won't be destroyed and Hashem won't allow it to be destroyed. Hashem runs the show. Hashem can decide that it won't be destroyed if he wants. But that, that's not what this is about. We're talking about a whole different ballgame. We're talking about something that is a direct creation of Hashem, by Hashem. It's something that exists outside of time, exists before time. This is connected. The origin of the Beis Amikdash is the origin of time. The third Beis Amikdash, if it's created by Hashem, it's not subject to time. The reason the third Beis Amikdash is going to last forever is because it's going to be a manifestation of Hashem in a way that has never been seen since before time was created, since before space was created. This has never existed. There's never existed anything in the universe that was a manifestation and expression of Hashem at this level, that it was so direct that it wasn't subject to time, period. That's the third base of English. The third base of English will be eternal because it's, 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 it's that expression of Hashem. It's Hashem's handiwork. It's not subject to time. And so to have that, for us to have access to Hashem in the world, in our physical bodies, as human beings, living in this world, eating physical food, doing physical things. And for us to be here and to be able to experience an expression of Hashem that's so far beyond everything that it's not even subject to time. Time doesn't apply to it. That's beyond, that, that, that's beyond our ability to even imagine it's beyond our ability to visualize we can understand the concept but that's beyond our ability to visualize at all and that is something that is immeasurably valued literally invaluable the word invaluable is is very highly abused overused but this is literally invaluable for us to be able to interact with an expression of Hashem that's beyond time in the world as physical human beings with our hands, with our eyes. And that's something that justifies the destruction of the second base of English. So now Rabbi Akiva was laughing. Rabbi Akiva was super excited. He was like, he said, he said, he said to himself, he thought to himself, and he said to them, he said to the other uh, Tanoim. We know now that we can get the third base of English. And the third base of English is not stamped the third in a sequence. It's not like the first, the second, and the third. The third base of interest in a separate category altogether. It doesn't work by the same rules. It's not subject to the laws of physics, to the laws of nature. It's not going to deteriorate. And Hashem, and, and this is the investment that Hashem made. Hashem doesn't enjoy Golas any more than that. You know, it's, it's hard to imagine, but it's the truth. You know, the same way that a kid never really believes that their parents suffer more from their pain than they do themselves. Parents tell their kids that. Uh, I tell my kids that I love them more than I love myself and more than they love themselves. And that when they're upset, it hurts me more than it hurts them. And they think it's, I'm saying something nice. It doesn't occur to them that it's actually true. But it's very literally true to a very real degree. Same thing about Hashem. It's like, oh, that's so nice. It hurts Hashem more than it hurts us. But it really does. Now think about what we collectively have been through in 2,000 years of gold. That's a whole lot of pain all together on one entity, all on Hashem. And whatever it hurt us, it hurt Hashem more. That's a cost that Hashem was prepared to accept because the ROI, the return on that investment, the positive outcome that was facilitated could only be facilitated by that cost is so invaluable that it justifies that. So the, the Hurban of the base Amikdosh is literally an investment on Hashem's part. It's Hashem accepting a cost because that cost facilitates profit, a positive outcome that can only happen if we accept this cost. It's dependent on accepting that cost. The same way that increasing, improving our health depends on us 
investing time and effort into doing exercise, staying healthy, eating good food. And the same way that growing a business depends on investing money, time, effort, et cetera. So the benefit, the outcome here, the third base Amitos, to have an expression of Hashem that's not even subject to time, that will be eternal by definition, not incidentally, the third base Amitos will be intrinsically eternal by definition because it's an expression of Hashem who is eternal by definition. For us to be able to have that, and I, I think it's fair, I'm, I'm going out on a limb, I'm speaking for myself and projecting that I am very well aware of the fact that I have no idea of what that even means in terms of the real value, but I can appreciate and understand that it's something that's invaluable beyond my ability to even comprehend, which makes it more, not less. So Hashem allowed the Beit to be destroyed was an investment. He allowed, he accepted a cost in order for a positive outcome to be made possible by that. Like, you have this need not to be alone, and as you were learning from Hashem, you have to remember that, that we the question is, what's the cost? What uh, There are many examples of investments we can make, of cost that we can accept in order to facilitate a positive outcome that justifies the cost. There are many, many examples. And we talked about some. Well, investing in financial well-being, in financial security, et cetera, investing in a business, invest very good things. And everybody should do them to whatever degree possible. Investing in health is a level up, right? Investing in money, right? Let's say we're investing in financial well-being. Why is that a good thing? It's a good thing because money facilitates things for us. Money makes things possible. Money affects our experience. And so by ensuring or causing, generating financial stability, financial security, that has an impact on, on our experience and on our life. Now, if it's such a good idea to invest in financial well-being, to invest in a business, to invest in having more money, because it's going to have an impact on our experience, how much even, how much superior is it going to be if we can invest not in something that affects our experience, but actually invest in ourselves and in our experience directly. That's going to be a much more efficient investment and it's going to be an investment that's going to give a much bigger ROI, a much bigger return on the investment relative to what we do. So one example of investing in ourselves is health, right? Investing, our health is who we are. It has a huge impact on our life experience. And out of all the ones we've talked about, I would say it's the most valuable. And it's the most valuable, number one, because it has the biggest impact. And number two, it facilitates all the other ones as well. The healthier we are, the better able we are to generate more income and to use it more effectively and efficiently, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in the category of investing in ourselves, there's one thing I want to focus on specifically, which we haven't touched on, we addressed it very briefly, but I want to really focus on it. Now, the outcome that we're investing in order to get to, in order to achieve, that I want to focus on is becoming the person that we want to be, that we believe we should be, and that we know that we can and should be. And again, I'm going out on a limb and projecting, but I'm projecting, I'm not just projecting, I'm saying this based on uh, a lot of data and sparring, et cetera, and I think it's, it's fair to say that most likely, just about everybody, I'm going to be a little bit conservative, knows that we, we know that we could and should be even better than we are. We could and should live a life even better than the one we're already. So the outcome that we want is to become the person we want to be and we know we can and should be. And to get to the place we want to be in and the place that we know we can and should be in and to live the life we want to live, we believe in living and we know we can and should be living. That's the outcome we want to get to. The question is, what's the investment we have to make to get there? Now, in terms of, at first, the basic resources we're going to have to invest is going to be the same, time, effort, Primarily time and effort, a lot of time and a lot of effort. Now, going back, right, there were, there were three 
questions or three stages. Stage question number one is what's the outcome that we want? Question number two is what do we have to do to, to get there? Or what's the thing that's going to make it happen? And then that next question is what do we have to invest in that thing to make it happen? So let's say financial security, we want to have a lot more money than we have now. So what do we have to do? We have to take money, invest it into something that's going to make it grow, and then we'll have more money. So what's the thing that, that if, if we had to pick one thing that's going to make us become the person we want to be and know we can and should be and, and get to the place and live the life we want to and know we can and should? If I had to choose one word that's going to sum it up, that word would be connectedness. Connection, but more specifically or precisely connectedness. Now, connectedness generally is a physiological need that people have. Feeling a sense of being connected is imperative for well-being. It's imperative for our physical well-being. It affects our, our, our nerves, our, our, our central nervous system. It affects how neurotransmitters work. It affects our hormones. It affects our mental well-being. It affects our emotional well-being. And a lack of connectedness is probably the biggest factor in a lot of the worst things that people go through. And increasing connectedness is the most powerful tool for writing things and for improving our quality of life. For people who are suffering as a result of lack of connectedness, certainly increasing connection is going to help. For anybody, the more we feel connected, the greater our well-being, the better off we're going to be physically and mentally and emotionally. And there are lots of like connections that are effective and powerful. Family, friends, community, commitments, causes. These are all things that can make us feel connected and they're very powerful and very important. But there's one kind of connection or one sense of connectedness that's in a completely different category to all of these. And that's a feeling of connectedness to infinity, a feeling of connectedness to the creator, to Hashem. And when a person feels, and I'm not talking about understanding or thinking or being aware up here, I'm talking about feeling. When a person feels a sense of connectedness to Hashem, it completely changes their experience. Number one, all the benefits that we get from any kind of connection, we're going to get from this sense of connectedness also. Feeling a sense of connectedness to Hashem also gives us clarity in why we're here. It gives, us a, gives our life a sense of meaning. It gives us a sense of purpose. It gives us a sense of individual purpose. It, it makes us know and feel that our life matters, our decisions matter, our actions matter. Getting out of bed in the morning matters. Everything we do makes a difference. And when a person feels a sense of connectedness to Hashem and to infinity, we end up with greater clarity and focus and energy and drive and ability to be effective in all the things we want to do, in our material pursuits, in our Torah, in our mitzvahs, in our learning, in our everything. And that is going to be the most powerful thing that's going to lead us to be the person we want to be, be in the place we want to be in and live the life we want to and know we can and should. Now, we're two thirds of the way through with three minutes to go. I have a tendency to do that. So, very briefly, practically speaking, how are we supposed to do that? That sounds nice. Maybe it adds up and makes a lot of sense. It might resonate for some of us. What does that mean practically? The answer to that is one word Chabad. Right? With, to my knowledge, the only group of Sidon that has two names. There are some that have two names because it's a combination of two groups from two different cities. Generally, Sidon have a name based on the city they came from. We have two names, not from two cities. We have Lababit and Chabad. Chabad is because we're not just about the customs of the city we came from. There's an ideology. There's a discipline. And that discipline is Chochma Bina Das. Why? If you ask someone who's not part of Chabad and ask them, what do you think of when you hear the word Chabad? Someone who knows of Chabad very superficially from the outside. What are they going to tell you? They're the people who dance on top of RVs in traffic jams and stop strangers on Fifth Avenue and ask them, excuse me, are you Jewish? Would you like to wrap some dead cow around your arm, right? Not, neither of those things are very academic. So Chochma bin Adas. So why are we Chochma bin Adas? The answer is that al Trevor says very clearly in Perikim of Tanya, why it's Chochma bin Adas, despite the fact that it doesn't seem necessarily to be that way, obviously. And al Trevor's words are Chabad Nikro, Imois, Umakar Lamidais, Ki Hamidas Hing Chabad. Chabad 
It's not really about Chabad. The Altreva's primary interest and objective is on Chabad. It's midos, it's feelings, it's our experience, how we feel. The bottom line is, you want to affect the way you feel, the way to do that in a real and, and permanent way is by using your head. Learn, Chachma, Bina, learn. The more we learn about Hashem, the more we learn and understand why we're here, what's going on, what's the bigger picture, and most importantly, Das, connecting to those ideas, connecting to what we learned about with our Chachma Bina, as we connect to these ideas and information and knowledge about Hashem, about why we're here, about the purpose of universe and existence, etc., that's going to change the way we feel. And as we connect with those ideas, we will start to feel a sense of connectedness to Hashem. And practically speaking, I mean, I would, one of the big parts of connecting to it is, I, I, I'll, I mean, in the purest sense, the, the way to do it is his point, let's say, practically speaking. Number one, Hisponidus is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do, and it always was, even before we became so distracted. But there are some other things that we can do very practically to help pull things out and, and connect to them. Number one is, is talking, right? The original Fabrengan, what was a Fabrengan? A Fabrengan, going back through the generations, wasn't people sitting around and someone talking, it was three, four friends sitting down, saying the Chaim, and talking about life, talking about what we're struggling, talking about what we're learning in Hasidus talking, connecting, making it real. And the more we take the things we learn about and connect with them and make them real, they become real, the more we'll feel a sense of connectedness to Hashem. And the more we feel connected to Hashem, it's going to have an impact on our bodies, our nefesh abahamis, and our nefesh alikis, because we are a combination of all three of those things. And all of them are going to be affected by that. And the result of that is that our awareness of why we're here in the full picture is going to increase. Our sense of, pers of, of purpose and meaning is going to increase. Our physical health and, and life expectancy is going to increase. And most importantly, the way we will live as a result of feeling connected to the creator, connected to infinity, is that that will result in us fulfilling the purpose of time and space, purpose of the universe, the purpose of all of us collectively, the purpose of 5,781 years of history and the purpose of each and every one of us individually. And so just now to go back to the question I asked in the beginning, which was, can you afford to invest in yourself? Rather than respond to the, answer the question, I'm going to be a good Jew and respond with another question, which is, can you afford not to? Okay.